many people consider hard science and metaphysical spirituality to be incompatible. Neil Helm is not one of those people. He's a near-death experiencer, and he currently serves on the board of the Virginia Beach chapter of the International Association for Near-Death Studies. He also serves as scholar in residence at the ARE, where he conducts research and assists faculty and students with their research projects. But he's also an expert on the field of satellites and satellite communications. He's been Deputy Director of the Institute for Applied Space Research, Senior Research Scientist in the Department of Electrical and Computer uh, Engineering at George Washington University. He's been President of Helm Communications, a satellite uh, company in Washington, D.C. He's a member of the International Academy of Astronautics, Senior Member of the IEEE, and served as Chair of its Aerospace Policy Committee. Associate Fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics and has served as Chair of its Communications Satellite Standards Committee. He served uh, on the Editorial Board of Space Communications, an international journal, and has been an expert witness before Congressional Committees. And he hasn't stopped yet. He's, re <laughs> he's recently completed a PhD a program in Transpersonal Psychology at Sophia University. But most of all, he's just a great guy who's helped countless people, countless times, in countless ways. So please welcome Dr. Neil Helm. Sometimes I wonder who that person is. <laughs> good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm always so pleased and honored to talk and share with this wonderful group of, of, of seekers of within the fellowship the inner light the inner light but shines so brightly this morning within all of us so wonderful so great so what why why is spirituality and science sort of on the outs and, and by the way i just have to give such credit to susan for choosing these these readings, um, I could, you know, basically read the first one and go home. Um, Tesla, our virtues and our failings are inseparable like force and matter. And Einstein, of course, the same thing, energy, force, energy, and matter. They're the same and, and, and they're so intertwined. And Science has a reputation of at times pulling them together and at times separating them. And sort of my job is to try to pull them closer together. It's important because the, the force part of it includes uh, things that are less tangible, like dreams and our emotions and our meditations and our near-death experiences. And for those who, who may not know, I've had a near-death experience at age five that profoundly changed my life. It just totally changed my life. And so I've been researching near-death experiences uh, pretty much since, but as an adult, and I did both my uh, master's thesis and my recent doctoral dissertation on near-death experiences. I, I'll tell you more about that in November. November 3rd or 4th, I speak to you again and I'll go a little bit of my dissertation. Oh, it's going to be boring, but... <laughs> but, but again, it, it's, it goes to the same issue of, of these things are important. Um, it, and, and mysticism, spirituality, they're so important in our lives, they're so important in our communities, they're so important to us that they deserve to get the recognition that we give to the harder sciences. So when I started preparing and I looked at the, the definition, I just went to the internet and pulled up the first definition of, of science. And at Collins Webster, and it said science is the study, the study of nature and behavior in materials and our physical universe that 
is studied through observation, through experimentation, and through measurement. And I thought, hey, I can, I can, I can handle that. that. That works. You know, observation, and then we experiment, and then we measure. That's all good. But the scientific method and the modern scientists today have changed the word, the last word, of measurement to reproduction, reproducibility. And they say that unless you can stamp again and again and again something and reproduce it and show it that you can reproduce it, it's not science. And right, right away I've got a, a big problem with them because Everything in nature changes. Everything in nature changes, and I'll get into that in a little more detail. But every snowflake is different. We were taught that. Every blade of grass is different. Every ray of sunshine is different. It's a, if you get into the subatomic particles of it, they're all different. So for the science community to say, oh, you've got to reproduce this in, you know, into some level of perfection, is wrong. So there's a whole group of us that, and I'm a very, very little part, of people that are working, and I'm working in this area of near-death experiences, but others work in, in, and I'll go over some of the areas, to try to give all of these spiritual, mystical, human, natural, so it's a natural science, is what we want to have. Not a science that says you've got to have material, the material has to be reproduced again and again. So that's where we're going to start. Uh, and there's going to be four examples that I'm going to go through briefly today and, and show what, what uh, this, and this is a very small part of my dissertation, uh, about 10 pages of my dissertation that I, that I included. So we're going to look at, at, at the first part is consciousness and the, in the brain and consciousness. And there's, again, the scientific method says everything is in the brain. Everything exists in the brain. And then there's the natural group and the scientists of us who say, no, 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 no. Consciousness can operate outside of the brain. And our prayers, our thoughts, our musings, our daydreams, our night dreams, our meditations, perhaps. You, you can put all these things, on, sensors, on your brain and around, and you can measure every, just about everything. But you find that you can't measure a muse. You can't measure a daydream. You can't, you can't measure consistently, anyway. It's not in the same place in the brain. And so people all the way back, 16th century, Emanuel Swedenberg, and in effect, go all the way back to Aristotle and Plato, these people felt that there was consciousness outside of the brain. So there's two big schools of thought that, that are working on that. But certainly, I believe that you can have consciousness outside of the brain, and, and that's the way it should be. And then the second of my four is one very specific example, a medical example of this, that is sort of like the, the capstone or the golden rule of, of, of these examples, or if you're in the law, the pro versus weight. It's, it's the one that we all talk about. And it, it's, it's the Pamela Reynolds is her name, a woman lived in the 80s in Atlanta, Georgia. A musician, she was a musician in her 40s, late 40s, and she had a brain aneurysm. And that's in the back when your one of your major blood vessels blows up a little bit like a balloon. And it was starting to leak, and if it would burst, then that stops the brain from the other that stops the blood from the other side of the brain, and that's called a stroke, and you die from aneurysm. So they thought that this was pretty well along and that they couldn't, they couldn't handle this. But a young physician said, wait a minute, I'm going to try something. Now, this was in the 80s. He said, I'm going to 
lower her body temperature below 60 degrees, I'm going to drain all her blood, and then I'm going to correct this aneurysm while her heart and her blood are not working. And if I can do it fast enough, I, I'll, I'm going to try to save her. So they packed her in ice, and on the way down, they, they sedated her, and they taped her eyes, and they taped their ears. But before they taped her ears, they inserted um, a, 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 a little uh, the things you put in your ear when you're listening to music. Little, Earbuds, whatever. And they put those in, and that was connected to a machine that transmitted in first one ear and then the next ear fairly quickly within a second. A hundred decibels of sound. Now, 90 decibels is hertz a ear, and decibels are logarithmic, every three doubles. So, a hundred decibels is ear shattering. It's, it really is extremely uncomfortable. Your whole system nearly jolts when you get 100 decibels. So they lowered her temperature, they lowered her temperature, and initially from, from those 100 decibels, her, her brain activity was just off the charts. It was just, this was just shattering her whole body. And as she cooled down, as she cooled down, it lowered and lowered and lowered to the point that, it was, that the, that the uh, machine no longer registered any life whatsoever. Her brain had stopped functioning, her heart had stopped functioning as they took the blood out as well. So they totally stopped her. And they went in with, initially with a drill. And they drilled open her head to look at the aneurysm. And they found it was too big and too far along. And so they had to stop and change courses, and they bought out a larger saw, big electric saw. And then they said, they asked a, a female physician who was part of the surgical team to insert a, um, a, a line up through her groin to her all the way up to the aneurysm, they were going to block it off and take the aneurysm out. And they did that, and they sawed her skull open and, and built a new canal around the aneurysm and sewed her up, warmed her up, hit her with, chest, with the chest thumpers and brought her back. And she lived for another 20 years. Um, perfectly, perfectly. Went back to singing. And three weeks later, when she was going back to her doctors for a review, and one of the doctors came in and, and he said, no, you know, I'm not, I wasn't really part of the main surgical group, but um, I, you know, I was there. And she said, oh yeah, of course you were there. She said, I had floated up to the, to the, to the ceiling of, of the operating suite. And I saw when you came in, all the rest of the guys were wearing blue and green. You had a pink thing. And he said, really? Yeah, you had a pink thing. And you came in and you were talking about this, and, 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 and then you talked to the guy who did the drilling. And the drill was in the, was in the, the, the note of D. And the guy wrote it down, and he said, and then when this doctor bought out the saw, he had two or three blades that were encapsulated in these clean containers. And he first bought out one blade, and then he bought out a second blade. And he chose that blade, and then he went back to the first blade, and he used that. Doctor wrote it down, and and she said, "Yeah." And she said, "And, and this woman talked about not being able to find a line in my groin, not being able to do that." Woman well, wrote it down, and he presented it to the team, and they got out the drill and they turned it on. Note of D. She described the saw in incredible detail. You know, the color of it, the way it looked, and they had bought it out of a box. So it wasn't out before they sedated her and put her under. And then they said, yeah, it was a woman who inserted and had trouble putting that line in her groin. And at this time, 
her heart and her brain were flatlined for 30 minutes. Totally flatlined, and that 100 decibels was not even registering. I mean, her, her, her brain was not operating. And yet her consciousness was able to see this level of detail as part of this near-death experience. And so it's, it's been written up in a whole journal on this in ex extreme detail that she went into. There's just no other way to, to, to say this now. And then we find other people that this has happened to, hundreds and hundreds of them. Hundreds of Dutch physicians has more than 100 people who've had this, it's called veridical or remote perception. And so they have organized hospitals. So they have over 100 hospitals who have put little signs way up in the ceiling that sort of said, if nobody can see this except you, and you've got to be up on the ceiling. It's hidden back in surgical suites. Unfortunately, not a single person has seen one in 10 years. We've still had people who have had near-death experiences. We still have people who've said they've risen up, but they haven't read those little signs. So there's something there, I don't know, that the, your consciousness, well, we're still working on that. But anyway, the Pamela Reynolds case is so incredible that we use that and show that to, and you know, people have tried to say, oh, well, you know, she could have seen something, her eyes were taped shut. Or she could have heard something over the de 100 decibels. That's totally impossible. So that's the second level where we've got proof, pretty solid proof, and we, and we want to reproduce this again and again as closely as we can. Again, it's natural, so everyone is going to be different. But we want to reproduce these examples so we can show the scientific community that these things happen. My, my third example is we've come across in our research of near-death experiences that people who are born blind, born blind, have never, never seen, have, have never had any sight. And they talk about objects and colors in metaphors because they've never really seen them. I mean, they, they've never really seen them. But in near-death experiences now, dozens, we've had dozens of examples in near-death experiences where people who, have, who were born blind saw color and objects perfectly in their near-death experiences, the first time they've ever seen them. And that's pretty well documented. Now, we've got, say, two dozen. But two dozen is not enough, not anywhere close enough for the scientific community to say, oh, yeah, that's, that's enough. So, so we're going to have to get more and more and more. But we have probably something like two dozen examples at this point of people who were totally born sightless. And then at the near-death experience, they, they're, 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 dead. They're, they're blind again. So it was in that time of the, of the near-death experience that, that their consciousness and their ability to see left their brain. And, you know, we, we talk about um, it, everything being in the brain, but we, there was a really good study, and again, we've got to reproduce this more and more and do a lot more research on this. There's one good, really, study that says the, the, the gray material in the brain also exists in the lining of your heart. And that the dendrites, that where information goes back and forth in the certain sectors of your, of your brain, the dendrites follow these muscles in your heart. And in many ways, the layers of your heart tissue that have this gray material are not quite as big, but just about as big as your brain. And then, where else do we find these gray materials? In your tummy, in your gut. So that we, we we're fairly sure, and we've got to study this a lot more, that not only does your brain work to do certain things, but that you've got levels of consciousness that work out of your heart and out of your tummy. 
And so you feel things in your tummy. You walk to the edge of, of something steep, and all of it's your tummy. You know? <laughs> or you feel sad, and it's in your heart. So, so we're, we're finding that there are areas that are outside of our brain. We can't just measure all these little nodes and can't measure. And, and even that group of scientists now have to admit there's something called placidity, which says that there's things all over the brain that operate different. There's some things that happen here pretty consistently, and there's some things that happen here pretty consistently. But if this gets injured, you, and this arm, this part of the arm is supposed to go to this part of the brain, really it's the opposite. It's, you injure this part, and all at once the arm starts working again. And so they measure what's happening up here when you do this. It's over here now. Or it's another place. So that's called placidity. So we know that the, this brain isn't the perfect thing, and that we do have consciousness. We do have consciousness outside of the brain. We do have consciousness in our heart and in our tummies. And that's all good. And we've got to keep proving that. My fourth example is just this quantumness. And I've talked about it, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in the future. But again, remember when I said everything above the atom is matter and is Newtonian science, and everything below the atom is quantum science. But everything comes up out of quantumness. Everything originates from the protons and the neutrons and all of that. And you can't control it. You can't control those protons. They have a, a mind of their own, which is not in your mind. And you can see a proton, and if it thinks you're looking at it, it'll change. It doesn't want to be seen. So it's going along as a sine wave, and it thinks if you're looking at it, it changes to a digit. To a to a digit like in our our, our did like you know our ones and zeros. And you think you know where it is, that proton, but it, it doesn't. It, it doesn't have a locality. They don't have a locality. And you can take two of them. You can take a proton and split it. And then you can, and they're twins. And you can spin one, and this one will spin. And you move them further apart. And we've taken one now in Chicago, in the Fermi lab, outside of Chicago, we've taken one to Geneva, the big CERN lab in Geneva. We've spun it here, and this one spins. I, I proposed an experiment to put one on the next thing that goes around the back of the moon. And you gotta have, it's not cheap, you gotta have really, really good clocks. You have to have clocks down in the tens of thousands of a second to be able to really prove this. But I believe you split this, this proton and you leave one on Earth and you put one back on the back side of the moon, not the front of the moon, back side of the moon. You spin this one, that one will spin perfect, the exact, exact same second, or split second, millions of a second. So they, they have a locality that's not controlled by our time and space. So there's just, and, and, the, and the Newtonian science community says, wow, <laughs> they didn't even want to study it for a long time. And now, pretty much all your physics programs have quantum physics. They're now a part of all physics programs so that you study quantumness. And they just don't go, go together. You say, well, okay, Newtonian physics, you can reproduce matter. But in quantum physics, you cannot reproduce these protons in the matter that everything is built of. So that you say, well, okay, if everything is built of protons and they don't have a time and a space that you can control, but why do you think you can reproduce everything else? And of course, a lot of us say you can't. And that we've got to keep working towards having this as a natural science. A natural science that 
includes all of our thoughts, all of our musings, all of our daydreams, all of our night dreams, all of our spirituality. It's so important to us, our spirituality. We need to have that recognized. Our mysticism, our love for our God, and our God's love for us. That, that's reproduced, but it's reproduced in a different way. It's different to every one of us. We're all unique. We all love God uniquely, and God loves us all uniquely. And this near-death experience is one of the ways of sort of, you know, finding out more and more about God's love and our unity and, and just the wonder of it all. And I'll talk more about it in November. Thank you.